All right, so let's uh, start from the top. What is Big ID? What does the company do? Yeah, so we basically help organizations get visibility and control around their data. So you could think of us as a data security compliance company, uh, next generation, uh, cloud native, um, although we do support kind of legacy data center as well, um, where there's increasing push for reasons of privacy, security, even data governance to know what data you have, what, what risky data you have, what valuable data you have. And that requires a way to look across, especially in the cloud, you know, hundreds of possible varieties of data sets from, you know, um, um, document DBs to, I saw your investor cockroach to everything that's possible in uh, AWS, Azure, GCP, all the various SaaS applications. And so there's a lot of complexity around knowing your data and then being able to do something around it, whether it's for reasons of uh, privacy. Um, uh, regulatory compliance like GLBA, HIPAA, PCI, uh, security in terms of remediating and, um, uh, and uh, protecting uh, sensitive data, and then even data governance, being able to equip the data scientists with visibility into where their high value data is as well. Both founders and investors uh, like to think about uh, when this tried to come up with a concept for a company, the, the why now moment. What was the why now for Big Idea? Yeah, so there hadn't been, uh, you know, so look, I, I kind of always followed the space and, you know, I was in New York, I'd sold a prior company and I was kind of in a corporate development role and I was kind of looking and talking to a variety of companies. Some wanted to get acquired, some we were targeting. So I had a reasonably good landscape and, um, I knew that I was only gonna be there until I got my green card. So I was kind of, uh, you know, part of me was thinking about what I wanted to do next. And one of the things I observed is the data protection space uh, hadn't really advanced very much in a, in a generation. A lot of the tools, like the DLP tools, data loss prevention tools as an example, they, are, they go back to the era of PCI. PCI, which is, stands for payment card information, is a, is a compliance requirement around payment card information, like so your credit card numbers. Uh, and that was really kind of 2003, 2004. And so a lot of these tools originated to help organizations find credit card 16 uh, digit numbers in things that existed in 2004, right? So that could be exchange server, that could be um, a, a file server from NetApp, it could be a SQL server from Oracle or Microsoft. Uh, and that was kind of like maybe SharePoint, but that's kind of it, right? Um, and of course, the world has changed as companies have accelerated the move to the cloud, which has only gotten faster on, um, uh, through COVID. Um, they just have more complexity in terms of where data could, could be stored. There's more proliferation. More VCs like Firstmark are funding companies that provide applications and places where you can put data. So it's dispersing into more and more places. Secondly, there's new regulations that are driving new requirements around compliance around that data. The one that you know, got our attention was uh, GDPR. And um, um, GDPR is a European privacy regulation. Um, it came, came into effect in 2018, I think May 26th, if memory serves me correct, give or take a day. And it had certain requirements around uh, data compliance. In particular, it said that companies need to provide transparency to consumers and employees around what data they collect and process on those individuals. And if you read the letter of the law, it requires them to know where every piece of your information is, not just your payment card data, not just your address, not just your name, but your IP address, your cookie, your session key, your credentials, your preferences, your clickstream history. And that's a lot of data and it be, could be kept in a lot of places. And we felt that the tools that were built in 2003 for Exchange and SharePoint and Mainframe were not gonna be the tools for the cloud to support this particular use case. And that was kind of the germination, the kind of um, the start of Big ID. That was the big idea of Big ID, if you will. And is a part of the complexity of GDPR that you need to be able to find all the data that relates to one individual in particular as opposed to other forms of data privacy laws. Yeah, so so GDPR and, and you know now today there's multiple there's regulations in most countries. Canada has a new regulation. Obviously California had CCPA, not obviously, but some of you may know California had CCPA, which was uh, replaced by CPRA. Uh, Virginia has a new law, Colorado has a new law. I think Washington State has a new law. Michigan, Ohio, Florida, Texas have new laws and committees. So again, it's getting more of a, a, a minefield. So under these regulations, consumers have a right to control their data. 
And that means being able to access their data. It also means being able to delete their data. Technically, under these regulations, the definition of what is personal is very broad. Historically, when you look at kind of breach regulations at a state level, the definition of personal data is, is very well defined, typically 13 or 12 attributes like address, name. Under GDPR, it could be anything, right? So my shopping preferences on Shopify could be personal data. My GPS coordinates. So right here, we all share a GPS coordinate, right? We're all in the same location. That could be personal. What makes the problem hard of being able to locate um, all of a person's data um, is that obviously there could be a lot of things that define what is personal. In fact, instead of saying, and I'll talk about what we did that's innovative there in a second, but that's one thing, because it could be a very big universe. The way I describe it is think of the old definitions of PII as kind of like the solar system, and then new definitions of PI, personal information more broadly, is like the Milky Way, right? So much, much larger scale. Uh, secondly, you have to be able to look everywhere, because the people that wrote these regulations know nothing about what a cockroach DB is, or what a SQL is, or what a, um, a Mongo is. They don't know what any of these things mean. They're lawyers, they're legislators, so you need to be able to just look everywhere where data is stored. And the last thing, and maybe the hardest thing, is you needed to be able to correlate the data back to an identity correctly, right? You don't want to confuse your data with my data. So we may share a GPS coordinate, by, but my instance of it is different than yours. And especially if I want mine deleted, you may not want yours deleted. So those three things represented a challenge. And so we used um, novel approaches for that kind of discoverability and actionability. We use graph, uh, graph uh, ML techniques. Yes, yeah, so uh, let's get into that. Um, so I'd love to understand sort of the architecture of the product. I mean, presumably you have a bunch of crawlers or connectors or whatever, like ways to get into the data. Sure. As a so, point. Yeah, so we started as a pure SaaS product. Uh, however, what we discovered early on is most of the companies that had this problem or cared about this problem um, were large enterprises. And back when we were started selling, so we started selling at the beginning of 2018, the large enterprises were still a little bit schizophrenic around cloud. They didn't mind some of their uh, ML kind of workloads in the cloud, but they didn't have their primary workloads in the cloud. And so we kind of split the product, the same product, but we essentially made it available, accessible uh, on-prem or through kind of even a hybrid deployment. So one thing to understand is while we started cloud native in AWS, we very quickly kind of realized that we needed to make the cloud runnable in GCP and Azure and in a private cloud, but also even in a, in a uh, legacy data center. So that's one thing we did. Um, the rest of the stack, basically, we, we didn't want to go uh, with agents because agents have complexity around instrumentation. There's some companies that have been successful with it, uh, with agents and sidecars, but we didn't want to do any of that. We wanted to leverage uh, the native protocol. What we do have is scanners. So we have kind of a two-tier architecture. We have a back-end server, essentially. Um, think of it as kind of in, a, in the plain old uh, telephone system, for those of you that remember it. There was kind of a switch in the, uh, in the headquarters. So Verizon, I think, here had a big, tall building, and there was like a big switch underneath. So we have kind of like the brains that could sit in the cloud or basically in the company's, in the customer's data, data center. And then there's scanners. And every instance of Big ID, and you could have many instances, uh, could have up to 100 scanners. Now, that orchestration of scanners obviously has complexity in that. How do you scale it up? How do you scale it down? You need a lot to potentially deal with very, very large workloads, petabytes uh, of information, whether it's unstructured or structured. Um, and the scanners essentially use native protocols. Now, they may differ. So for instance, for Hadoop, we could do like MapReduce. Uh, we could do um, direct uh, connect connectivity to um, uh, uh, Hive or Spark we could use but they all use native protocols to scan the underlying system. Now, we don't just do one kind of scanning. So the thing that I described early on, that how we started, that was for privacy. That was our first use case, and honestly, the only thing we sold for two years. As we, A, raised more money, and we raised, I think, I don't know, 250 now, um, we expanded the methods that we support so that we could get into more data governance use cases, more security use cases, more compliance use cases. But in the early days when we did just privacy, we essentially, it, 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 it relied on a training algorithm. So you would train the system on what is personal data for you. And that personal data could be in Chinese, it could be in Italian, it could be in French, it could be in English. So it was language agnostic. And then from then on, once the system is trained, it basically runs itself and could look everywhere for an individual data. So it's the scanner layer. Uh, on top of it, you have the graph database layer, which 
establishes a relationship between the different parts, and then that's on top of that, you have machine learning to extract patterns. Is that yeah? That's that the kind right of a simplified. So we have the scanners. Uh, the back end, we have a graph. Uh, uh, the scanners don't do the sc scanners. Kind of do parsing. They're kind of like dumb uh, endpoints. Um, most of the orchestration is in the back in the back end. Uh, that's also where we store the graph uh, information. Um, so we have a graph database uh, embedded in the system, um, and uh, we don't. We try. We don't. We try not to keep data for reasons, regulatory reasons, privacy reasons. So we essentially keep uh, almost like a GPS. We keep pointers that are tokenized and salted, and then we have a little bit of encrypted metadata to make it searchable. So think of it as this kind of virtualized inventory of the data. It's searchable, um, but the data still stays in Snowflake and Databricks and in Hadoop and SMB, NFS, SIFS, whatever that is. So I'd love to um, double click on what you started talking about and um, understand the use cases. So privacy, what is a scenario for privacy uh, and how does Big ID help and then maybe move to uh, the other areas, governance? Yeah, sure. So I'll kind of describe our evolution in kind of uh, three steps. So the first, so I would still, look, our, our tagline, if you go to our website, is know your data, control your data. So kind of very similar to what I described around data visibility and, um, uh, and control. What we focused on for the first kind of three, four years of our history is really just knowing your data and looking for applications of where do you need to know your data? Why, did, why was it important? So first we settled on privacy, right? So I think we were six people when we sold our first enterprise customer, Nike, and I sold it from like the backyard in Mamaroneck in, in Orienta. Uh, by the pool, I didn't even I didn't even have a shirt on, um, and uh, our second deal was Intel, um, and these were like meaty meaty first deals, and it was like literally dialing for dollars. We didn't have any relationships, we didn't even have investors that had connections in the, these firms, but we looked for uh, kind of a repeatable use case, and we the GDPR one was appealing because a the old technologies couldn't solve the problem. Um, there was obviously a regulation over the horizon. Um, it impacted large companies. They would have liability both in terms of the, um, the country regulators, the DPAs, uh, potentially individuals. Um, and so we focused on that use case. Um, and so privacy, and in particular, just this data access, data deletion use case, that's all we did. That's all we did for two years. But what we found is something that was highly differentiated. And because of that, in our first full year, we did five million in revenue. And in our second full year, we did 15 million in revenue. And so that gave us the kind of springboard to raise more money. Uh, we, we struggled uh, raising our seed money. Uh, we almost couldn't get it. Um, uh, but so we, when we did start getting money, we kind of, I think it was our C round, which we got sometime mid or September of 2019, that we started first thinking, okay, what does know your data mean? How do we expand this from the single privacy use case into other regulatory, um, other uh, security and even, even data governance use cases. And so what we built is a set of four technologies for looking at your data. One focused on metadata, right, for the data governance, for the data science use case. Um, so how do you extract and harvest metadata, label it automatically, uh, do it at scale across structured, unstructured, semi-structured, being able to deal with billions of objects and tens if not hundreds of petabytes. Uh, secondly, we did um, uh, data classification leveraging um, uh, natural language processing, deep learning, to be able to identify almost any kind of crown jewels, something of value, right? Because things of value also represent risk. So that could be maybe a recipe, that could be a patent, that could be uh, an employee document, anything. And then lastly, we developed a technology to be able to profile data at scale. What that means is being able to not only gather statistics on that data, but look for duplicate, redundant uh, data, understand dispersion, uh, parts of lineage. And so we developed each of these four technologies over a course of probably two years to give us an ability to address not just privacy, but security, uh, data governance, um, and then lastly, um, uh, kind of data lifecycle management, um, people that care about duplicate redundant data. So there's kind of four use cases that drove that kind of know your data. And there we stopped. And after that, we, we added the control part. Um, and I don't know if you want me to continue or you want to ask another question. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious how that works from a, a good to market and sales perspective. Do you have presumably different buyers uh, we in do. this? We have yeah, we have three How audiences. Yeah, so about, I would say about 40, 
give or take 40% of our business is the CISO organization, about 40% the CDO, maybe about 20% is uh, privacy and, and compliance. Um, uh, look, having more kind of uh, uh, at-bats never, never hurts. Um, we don't have to sell all three. Uh, we could get a land before we expand in any one of those three organizations. Um, What's your favorite land? You know, it, it's funny. It varies with who we have. Uh, right now, we have a lot of uh, sellers that come from the security world. And obviously, as the market kind of uh, gets a little bit more challenged in terms of uh, sales cycle, security is a good place to be. Um, they, their budgets tend to shrink the least. Um, you know, we do a lot of business with CDOs. Um, you know, the partner we were just meeting that I was uh, coming from and having dinner with uh, tonight, you know, we had representation from privacy, we had representation from the data organization and from the security organization um, because it does impact the business. Look, every part of that business needs to know their data. And data is becoming the, I think, as organizations um, uh, go to the cloud or accelerate to the cloud as they undergo digital transformation, if you will, depending if you're an old school consulting and that's how you refer to it. Um, there's all these new challenges, but on top of that, you have this issue that there's a high cost. You're renting storage now. You're not capitalizing it with your NetApp and EMC server and so forth. So there's much more vigilance that's at play, both in terms of data life cycle, in terms of data reduction, minimization, and so I think it's just becoming much more complicated. And also I believe that when data was in New Jersey in your data center, which was like where JP Morgan kept it and you know, UBS and everybody else, people had this false sense of confidence that they knew kind of what was in there, right? Um, and that it was protected. They had a padlock on the door, they had some gatekeeper, maybe a security guard. And so it felt safe. Now that data is in the cloud, and there's multiple stakeholders that have requirements around the data because auditors and regulators and, um, and boards wanna know what's at risk and what's a value. I think it just becomes more complicated. So products like ours, like I would say we've done well, um, you know, we'll cross 100 million this year, um, but I think it's just now, we're not in any marketing report. There is no Forrester Wave or Gartner MQ, but there will be this year, right? So we're now getting into a point where Every big consulting shop is looking at a practice around this. Um, the analysts kind of recognize this as a precursor to, you can't do the control unless you know what you're controlling, right? You can't do access on something unless you know what it is. is it, am I gonna put restrictions on accessing the data if I don't know what it is? So I think that's becoming a value. The one last thing I'll just kind of mention in terms of our evolution though is we realize just knowing your data and knowing you have a problem is not good enough you need to be able to fix the problem or get more value from the data, either through reporting or, um, or whatever. And so we struggled for a while um, trying to think through, well, how would we do this? Are we gonna just pick one like DLP or DAM or, or DRM or whatever, any acronym SUPA you want or DSPM? And we realized, you know, why don't we borrow a page from the playbook of Microsoft and Amazon and Splunk and Apple iPhone and create a marketplace a marketplace of apps that essentially allow you to layer on controls, both big ID controls as well as third party controls, right? From Calibra, Alation, ServiceNow, uh, and essentially create this kind of uh, thriving ecosystem. So one of the things we did early, which is kind of a little bit unique for a company of our size, right? It took CrowdStrike a decade before embarking on their uh, marketplace strategy, is um, in around kind of mid 2020, we said, you know what? We can't really choose what control we want to layer. So let's think through all the controls you can have around data privacy, data, um, uh, data security, data governance. Some will build, but some will encourage other parties to provide. So like we have a, Cali uh, Calibra has a data stewardship module. ServiceNow has two, one for workflow and one for, um, uh, one for CMDB integration, bi-directional CMDB integration. We have one with Tableau. We have one with Snowflake around access control and masking. We have ones with, all, you know, um, Talus is building one or has built one, uh, their, um, their encryption company, but as well as uh, Fortanix and others. So right now we have like 50 to 60 apps, about a dozen of them our own. And the nice thing is, is that it allows organizations to grow. So we could land with that kind of know your data, but then when it comes to access control, remediation, data minimization, data retention management, there's an app for that as Apple would say. How far along were you when you started that marketplace? Uh, look, we were, 
you know, like it was a couple of years ago. So look, we were, we had revenue, but I, I still think it was probably under 30. Um, um, we had a little bit, you know, we benefited, you know, I think we decided to do it after the tiger, uh, money came in. So we had to kind of spend the money on something. Um, and back then you just, you know, hired a lot of people. So, um, you don't do that anymore. Um, but, um, but yeah, and we, but you know, I think it basically came because we realized data is a massive problem. Right. And historically, people kind of ignored it. You had vendors that specialized in pockets of it, like Verona's, for those of you uh, that are familiar with it, that focus just on unstructured data. So things in your SMB. You had um, Proofpoint that just focused on email. Um, you had Semantic that did a little bit of unstructured, but mostly structured. Uh, you had, you know, Calibre or, or their um, antecedents that focused on just extracting metadata from SQL databases. So it was kind of a hodgepodge. There was nobody that provided you universal visibility across the data. And we think that's important to have a consistent set of rules, uh, controls for, again, uh, reporting on that data, uh, whether it's to regulators or whether it's to uh, board members um, or controls just around access. So that was kind of what we embarked on. I, I, don't, I don't think we've reached our destination, um, but I think we've been able to kind of pull ahead in the station, so to speak. I'm not sure if that metaphor works, but you kind of get what I mean. That's very interesting. I mean, the, the, the idea of like building a marketplace for companies uh, is great. It's, it's particularly hard to pull off, um, especially for like a, a younger company. So I was curious about. Uh, we have yeah. a you know surprisingly good attach rate. Yep. Again, we always focus on that kind of know your data problem, that discoverability, that classification. It uses different terms. So data governance talks about it in terms of catalog. Security talks about it in terms of classification. Uh, privacy or compliance talks about it around inventory of um, uh, critical data. They may use slightly different terms, but that's always kind of our starting point. I think we benefit from the fact that if you're going to the cloud, you got to know what you have. It's a little bit like moving houses, right? You don't want to take everything with you. So you got to go through, you got to rummage through your closets first uh, to figure out what, what you're going to throw away or give to Salvation Army. And then once you're in the cloud, you want to kind of keep it nice and, and pristine as well, because again, you're paying for every gigabyte. Um, but yeah, so we start that way and then the rest is an um, add on. So still within the go to market uh, part of the, the discussion, I, I'd love to rewind back to something that you said uh, earlier about you selling from the pool without your, your shirt on. Yeah, uh, don't, don't tell Nike. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, if you ask, you know, VCs for what it's worth, like a lot of people are going to say, well, you know, uh, if you're a tiny company selling to the Nikes of the world, it's super hard, don't do it, sell instead to, you know, startups or early adopters. What, how were you able to pull it off and any lessons learned for, you know, people in the audience who might be early stage entrepreneurs? Yeah, so look, there's a couple of things here. So and I'm going to be very, very honest. Um, one is the reality was the people that cared about our problem that we, you know, we built this beautiful mouse trap. Well, we got to we got to look for the people with the mice. Right. So the ones that had the problem most acutely and had the biggest penalty, like, um, you know, the regulators in the UK or France, like Canil, they're not going after Joe's auto body. They don't care about Joe's auto body. They're going after the multinationals. So they had the problem. Secondly, it's also a matter of comfort zone, right? Um, I was starting this company in my late 40s. I'm 52 right now. I'm sure you guys all think I'm 35. Um, so I kind of had sold to enterprises. And on top of that, I didn't know a lot of like the CTOs and a lot of these, you know, your startups are 25 years old. I don't know them, right? I know the people that are CTOs at the bigger institutions. They're more my age. So I think there is also just a comfort zone in terms of, who I was comfortable selling. So today we do sell to SMB, not, we sell to mid-market. I would not say SMBs, uh, but obviously I don't do the selling and we have a bunch of young people doing, like doing the talking to the younger. But I do think there needs to be a compatibility and I do, you know, I may, it may sound terrible, but I do think there's a reality to it, right? You sell to who you're comfortable with. And, um, and so again, we looked at who had the problem most acutely and had a penalty if they didn't do something. And then secondly, who would we be able to dialogue with and explain the problem and would have the attention span to deal with us? As I was prepping for this, I also read that, um, if I understood correctly, you have a, a motion to go down market that uh, very nicely you call small ID. Small, I came up with the name, everybody. That, that, yeah, that's, yeah. that's that's very, uh, very cool. And again, that's like another sort of unconventional thing. Like you'll hear a lot of people saying, well, once you start selling to Global 2000, going down market is harder. How, how do you I would do say, it? Yeah, look, and here's, you know, for the entrepreneurs in the audience, like here, here's what I'll kind of share with you, um, having kind of done both. 
if you start selling to SMBs, it's very, very hard. It may seem like, oh yeah, I'll just add more features and I'll go up upscale. The reality is when you sell to large enterprises, every no two enterprises are the same. They're basically like snowflakes, right? Um, and um, depending on the authentication that they use, whether it's um, um, uh, 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 Kubernetes or Ker Kerberos or, or um, SAML or, or um, uh, whatever, they all use password vaulting technologies like CyberArk and HashiCorp and, and Beyond Trust and Tychotic. They all want role-based access control. So not just integration with your LDAP and AD, but the ability to scope down. So they have these enterprise requirements around reporting around and so I think it's hard for small companies because they haven't done that. They haven't sold to that. You know, sometimes they just came out of college. They don't know what RBAC is or why a company would care about that. Um, they don't know what, you know, why they need to integrate with password vaults as an example. Why don't they just give me the credentials? And so I do think it's hard to go from small to big uh, because when you sell to a smaller company, they just want the easy button, right? They don't have the bandwidth. They don't have the resources. Now, having said that, it's also no, not trivial to go from big to small, right? Because one of the things you do for big is you make your solution highly configurable. So the Accenture's PwC love that. The big companies, they don't love it, but they need it because again, no two are the same. But configurability can easily look like complexity in a smaller organization. They go, oh my God, overwhelming number of choices, lots of things I could choose from. It's like, it's like, you know, like Apollo mission, right? Lots of knobs to get to the moon. So we needed something that essentially eliminates the complexity, which is great for configurability, um, but something that provides more of an easy button. Now, there's certain assumptions, right? We're not going to support on-premise. If you have it, tough beans. Um, you have to do automated discovery. Um, you know, we're only going to give you, you know, we're not going to do our back because smaller companies don't really care. Uh, they have like a CTO who's also the CISO who's also the CDO. They have like one person in that, in that seat. Um, so small IDs are temp. Now, it's a journey. We did a soft rollout. We have a little bit under a million dollars in revenue. We started uh, rolling it out around September. Um, we learned some things. Um, we also wanted to make it consumption so we could do our snowflake thing. Um, we're adding a few more things. And look, we have high hopes that that'll be our solution for smaller businesses, easier to understand. And it's a little bit self-selecting, right? I'm a small business, I go with small. Um, and you know, we have clever, clever phrasings, you know, big things start, you know, come in small packages or small things like, like that. Start small before you go big, et cetera. It creates kind of an easy, and it's an easy model, right? If you have complexity or if you want to graduate to something that requires a lot more configurability, different users to, um, of the product, big ideas, under the hood, it's the same thing. It just has a very different user experience uh, uh, for it. And it's only available SaaS. Great, and maybe to close before I open up um, to questions here. This is your third startup? There's, yeah, look at me, look at my gray hair, yeah, third startup, yeah. At 35? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'd love to hear like, anything you, 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 you can share, you know, things that uh, you wish you knew then, that you know now, that you wish you well, knew I, then. I thought black swans, I remember, so I started my first company right around two, 2000. Um, so we had the full kind of uh, hurricane uh, impact from, um, uh, from the first kind of uh, black swan event. And they told me this was gonna be kind of once a career and I think I'm on my fourth now. Um, so, um, look, I think that's, cha that's challenging. I do think, so much of this is situational, right? There are times when I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great to just sell to other startups, right? Like what you're just describing. Some of those companies are able to just get huge amount of traction really early by selling to friends, selling to connections to the VCs. But then when something like this happens, like good luck selling to another startup today. They're trying to like rationalize all of their tools. We are doing it. And it's much better to be selling to enterprises and selling to security. So again, you know, depending on my mood and day, I'd say, oh, wouldn't it be great to sell in small companies? Today, I'm pretty happy we're selling enterprises, right? The sales cycle may be a bit longer, there's more complexity, um, but at least there's more stability in those buyers, especially when you have uh, this kind of my fourth uh, um, uh, black swan, if you include 2020 and then 2008 and then uh, 2001. Um, so, so there's that. Um, look, I, I wish I knew then what I know now in terms of raising money, in terms of public speaking. I do think it's very important to be able to tell a story, right? The reason I was able to sell Nike, I think we only visited them once before they gave us a check for 400,000. We told them we're six people. They had, they had no illusions about how, you know, how big we were over Zoom. Um, 
but I do think it's important to be able to tell a story, right? That narration is, is huge. It's, it's big if you're writing fiction. It's, it's important if you're uh, starting a company. So I think I didn't really know that in my first company, uh, not even in my second. We did API security, which today is a big topic. Back then, nobody knew what an API was. So <laughs> it's a little bit like wandering the desert. Um, uh, so um, I also think that there's a timing. You know, the other thing that I kind of have learned is, and you know, I do still hope to have a fourth company. So we'll see. We'll see if I if I don't keel over before then. Um, um, you know, I think one thing I've learned is when I did my first two companies, I kind of did blue ocean type stuff, right? Um, hey, this is a new problem, a new concept. That's really hard because market timing is everything, right? And like I said, my second company, we, we started talking about API security and management in 2003. Nobody knew what the hell an API was. They couldn't even spell an API uh, until really Amazon Web Services came out, mobile applications took off. So you're really looking at 2009, 2010. So when we did our, this company, we said, okay, there needs to be a tailwind. There needs to be some kind of propellant or catalyst. So we looked like for a regulation, right? There, there is budget dollars set aside for GDPR. And if we get a portion of them, look, we just need to get a million dollars. Five million was kind of even better, but that was kind of a catalyst. Uh, so I think looking for that catalyst. The other thing I would probably do for my next company is something where there's an already established spend. Right, privacy was still a new category. Yes, there was money because of the regulation, but as you know from Snowflake and you know anywhere where you may already have data warehousing dollars and you're just creating a better solution, um, or you know CrowdStrike where there's like endpoint security um, a budget set aside from McAfee and Semantic, and you could just take money. Um, so I think that's really important. I think as you think about what you want to do, any place where you could displace or essentially take out, and I think that's more important now, especially during a downturn, um, is hugely important. So look for a catalyst like a regulation um, if you can, but also look for an opportunity um, where, again, there's something that if they use your product, they're going to be able to save some money by replacing something else. Very cool. Thanks for sharing.